In our Bibles back uh, to Ephesians 6 again this afternoon. Uh, I want to pick up where we left off uh, from this morning and uh, keep going through here. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll spend some time next Sunday as well, just uh, as a heads up, Lord willing, uh, we'll all be here. Uh, verse 18 uh, and following, we'll talk about prayer uh, as it relates to this armor of God next Sunday. Uh, this afternoon, though, let's focus our hearts and minds there on verses number 14 uh, through 17, okay, the armor of God. And again, Paul says to us uh, to take up, verse 13, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. And then he gives this armor that he's been talking about. He says, stand therefore, verse 14, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And all of God's people say, So when I look out at you, I see, uh, I see an army of soldiers. The devil wants me to see you. Um, I think I know you well enough to know that you, you are a sinner. <laughs> so the devil wants me, wants us, to look around and see our fellow brothers and sisters and to see the sin, uh, to see a church full of problems. People prone to grumble and mumble and murmur as our forefathers in the wilderness. To see people who lack confidence in God, who are afraid of the devil. But yet God tells us here that what we should see with our eyes, our spiritual eyes, we should see an army. We should see soldiers. And so through faith, we see each other, we should see each other as soldiers and as those who are enlisted, as I mentioned this, uh, this morning, uh, in the army of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the Lord has given us uh, armor. He's given us an armor uh, so that we can't be assailed. And he's here uh, playing off of a, of a Roman legionnaire uh, soldier uh, with various pieces and parts of their armor um, that they would use, defensive as well as offensive. And so you and I are called again to courageous spiritual warfare and we're called to fight, if I can put it this way, divinely, to fight divinely. Notice what he says there, uh, verse number 13, take up the whole armor of God. What do you notice about that phrase, the whole armor of God? It's God's, right? It's God's. So um, it's, it's not an armor that we ourselves are to go buy or we ourselves to, uh, to, to craft on our own. Uh, to find a, a smith somewhere to bang out a sword for us or to go find some shoes at uh, Burlington Coat Factory that, that we can use in our spiritual battle. We're called to fight in the armor of God. It belongs to Him. And so therefore, He alone can give it to us, lend it to us to wear. And so what that means is that when we talk about the armor of God, we're talking about God's own armor. He is the warrior for His people. And what's so amazing about what Paul says here, Paul, uh, Rabbi Saul, is a good Jewish rabbi who knew his Old Testament backwards and forwards. Uh, where do we think he got this idea that there's an armor of God? Shouldn't it be too hard? Oh, you're sitting too far back. I can't hear you. What did you say again? Okay. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. <laughs> so it comes from the Old Testament. Surprise, surprise. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 59. Uh, Elder Miranda didn't mention the verse, but I'll mention the verse, verse 17. So uh, there's also Isaiah 52, uh, verse 7. That's this idea of shoes. Uh, Isaiah 59, 17, there's this breastplate image. Uh, there's a belt of truth that the Messiah wears, in fact, in Isaiah 11, verse 5. Uh, he wears a helmet of salvation, Isaiah uh, 59, 17, again. Uh, even more so, uh, there's, in the Old Testament, the language of shield. It's pretty familiar in the Old Testament. Read the Psalms, right? Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Uh, we even sing that uh, verse from uh, Psalm number three. So the shield in the Old Testament was God himself. Remember when God called Father Abram out and he told him, you know, all this, all these stars that you see and all the sand that you can see on the seashore, your seed, your sons and daughters, your uh, line, your family, 
the people that are going to come from you are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sand. And then Abraham, or Abram fell asleep at night. He had a vision of God, he had a dream. And he saw the smoking oven, the smoking, burning oven, smoke and fire, images of God in the Old Testament, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. And Abram had sacrificed some animals, and he cut them in half, and he laid them out and put them in little rows. And then in this little vision he had, he saw this fire and cloud, God himself, passing through. And then Father Abram told uh, the Lord told Father Abram, I am your shield. I am your shield. So the image of shield in the Old Testament is God himself. So the armor of God, the armor of God, right? The Messiah, God in human flesh, prophesied in the prophet Isaiah, wears a belt of truth, a breastplate of righteousness. He has shoes on his feet. He wears a helmet of salvation, and he himself is the shield, protector of of his own people. So you are called to courageous spiritual battle, first and foremost, right, with this armor of God. It's God's. But you don't want to miss, though, that you have to put it on, right? It's God's armor. He is the armor, right? All these things speak of him, but you've got to put it on. Uh, John Calvin, reformer, 16th century reformer, said this, he said, the Lord offers us arms for repelling every kind of attack. It remains for us to apply them to our use and not leave them hanging on the rack or a wall. So if I was to give you, you know, a nice suit or someone was to give you a nice dress or someone was to give you, a, you know, this cool thing of armor, what good does it do you if it just sits on a hook in your closet? hung up over a door somewhere. You have to take it down and put it on and apply it. So we can't be cold then in a spiritual battle. We can't be lifeless. We can't just, as the old saying said, let go and let God. We can't just think that, well, God's going to do it all. He's got me. Well, yes, but it's a both and. God himself is the armor. It's his, the armor of God, but also you're called to put it on. Notice that. Take up, verse 13, right? That's an imperative verb, take up. It's a command, it's action. And so he provides us in, uh, this armor, with a whole arsenal of ways to fight against Satan, but you've got to apply it, you've got to appropriate it to yourself. And so let's check these little uh, pieces out and see what they teach us and uh, help us to understand what it means to fight against the devil. So he calls us to stand and fight, having fastened on the belt of truth. Uh, the belt for a Roman soldier was what held everything into place. Uh, his undergarments, his breastplate, uh, his leg armor. The belt is kind of like what like cinched it all together, kept it all connected. And so it is with this belt that we are to have, which is truth. Notice the belt of truth, right? It's not, again, not a literal coat of arms that you're supposed to go fight out against your, 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 your demonic enemy, that guy or that woman politician down the street. No, this is against the devil. It is a belt of truth, we are told here, a belt of truth. Well, what's the truth? Well, Jesus, of course, said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are to know the truth about the evil days in which we live, as verse 14 says, they're evil. We live in a present evil age, Galatians 1 says. We live in, a, in, a, in days that are very dark, Romans 13 says. We are to know this. We have to know the truth about the devil. He's our enemy, no matter how appealing and attractive he might look as an angel of light. He's our enemy. We've got to know the truth about ourselves. Once children of wrath, Ephesians 2 said, once dead in trespasses and sins, yet made alive. Made alive and been given hope. We must know the truth about who God is, that in his great love he's made us alive in Jesus Christ. Who in his great love, as chapter 1 said, he predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters. And we got to know the truth about Jesus. Amen? Amen? He's redeemed us by his blood. He gave himself for us, and he gave himself to crush the devil's head and to nullify and to neuter the power of the devil. The belt of truth. Paul says, stand, fight, having put on the breastplate, verse 14, 
of righteousness. Now, the breastplate uh, kind of like would be equivalent today to uh, bulletproof armor, right? Body armor. That's, that's what it was. It protected your vital organs, your heart, your lungs, uh, kidneys, and all that stuff. Protects it. The same way our breastplate protects our souls, protects our heart, the deepest part of who we are. As we read through Paul's epistles, we learn that the breastplate stands for two things. And I'll just quickly summarize them. First, Jesus Christ's own righteousness imputed to us through faith. Justification by faith alone. The righteousness of God is found in Jesus Christ. We are unrighteous, he's righteous. We can't stand before God, he he allows us, he enables us to stand before God. We are unacceptable in ourselves to stand before God because we're so sinful, yet in Christ we are given his righteousness to be accepted by God. That's what it means in the first place. But secondly, there is a righteousness of a transformed life. So we have Christ's righteousness imputed to us, right? It's all his. He just credits it as if it's ours. That's justification. The power of the Holy Spirit, though, imparts to us little by little, drip by drip, as it were, Christ's righteousness for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live a life that is different, transformed. We've seen that throughout uh, these chapters, four, five, and now six. Now, the devil loves in his schemes and in his strategies and in his his wiles, he loves to get Christians all messed up about the righteousness of God. He wants us not to understand what it means to be justified, to stand acceptable and righteous before God. He wants you to be confused about these things. He wants you to think that there's God's righteousness and that I can somehow attain to that righteousness by my own efforts, by my own good works. Or he wants us to be confused and think, well, I can't quite meet the the standard of God's righteousness. I can't quite earn it myself. But if I do my best, God will do the rest. We might think of ourselves as a big piece of Swiss cheese that we, we do all that we can. And there are holes in our righteousness. There's holes in our good works. There's, there are holes in our love for God and love for our neighbor. But all these holes, we, we bring ourselves to God and, and God then sort of patches us up and fills in the holes. The devil wants you to be confused about these things. The devil makes various accusations against us. He likes to remind us of the perfect righteousness of God against all sin, that God gives a perfect and eternal punishment against all sin. And you, sinner, have sinned against this all-righteous God, and you, sinner, deserve His perfect eternal punishment. Sounds logical, doesn't it? But we are to respond as children of God When the devil likes to remind us of God's righteousness and my unrighteousness, we are to remind the devil of another of God's attributes, his perfect justice. He will not punish the same sin twice. Jesus suffered. Jesus was punished. Jesus underwent the righteousness and the judgment and the justice of God so that we don't have to. That's what we mean by justification by faith alone. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, that's Jesus Christ's own righteousness, that he's imputed to you. The devil also likes to accuse us that, well, it's not enough to have Christ's righteousness. You have to be underneath that breastplate of righteousness. You've got to be intrinsically holy. Didn't God make Adam and Eve in his own image in the beginning? And didn't he command Adam to be perfect? Doesn't Jesus say that you've got to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees? Didn't Jesus say that you've got to be holy as God is holy? And since you're not even close, how can you expect God to look upon you on that final day in any way other than judgment? You think you can stand before the judgment of the perfect, just judge? Remind the devil when you feel that way, you you have those thoughts running through your mind, there's no way God can ever accept me. 
Remind the devil that Jesus' life and death were not just for all of your past sins, but for all of your present sins and every sin you will ever commit. Past, present, future. Jesus paid it all. And all, in that sense, means all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And he he doesn't allow that white as snow to then get muddied. He washed it. He washed you white as snow. The devil also likes to accuse us that while Jesus forgives our past and present sins, and even he forgives our future sins, we might, we, as, as, as I just said, yet the devil likes to say, but still you are tainted by original sin. So Jesus forgives all the sins that you've done, but deep down inside there's this original sin, this taint on your nature. Didn't Paul, in fact, say something like that? The devil whispers to us, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Remind the devil that the sacrifice of Jesus was a sacrifice of one who was born holy in the place of those born sinful. And that it was a sacrifice of one who was truly divine, truly holy. He gave himself for you completely, 100%. So put on this belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Stand and fight with shoes on your feet, and these shoes are uh, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, in, uh, in the ancient world, the Romans were, were great, uh, uh, obviously a great warrior culture. Uh, they lasted for over a, th- for over a thousand years, uh, and they innovated in many different ways. One of those ways was to take sandals and to add little spikes on the bottom, kind of like uh, cleats today. They would, that would give them uh, traction and an, an advantage to move forward, uh, in their various uh, arrays or when they were hit against to be able to withstand, uh, say, uh, cavalry and so forth. But they had traction on their, on their shoes, on their uh, sandals. Don't, don't, don't think of shoes, think of sandals, really. And so it is with the gospel, right? Notice, we have shoes on our feet, sandals for our feet, which is this readiness given by the gospel of peace. It's the gospel that gives us stability in life. Just like those little spikes in the bottom of sandals gave stability to a soldier, to a legionnaire. In the same way, the gospel gives us stability in this world. How? Because as notice the gospel of peace. Didn't Paul already tell us back in Ephesians 2 that Jesus Christ himself is our peace? Right? There are these, this, this group of Jews and this group of Gentiles, and they had this war between them. The Jews had all the regulations against the Gentiles. They looked down their noses upon them. And the Gentiles thought of these Jews as superstitious fools. And they hated one another. There was this wall of division that was being built up brick by brick between them. Christ has come and he's toppled that wall. And he's brought Jews and Gentiles together. And the gospel is a gospel of peace. The shoes that you wear is the, go- are the, go- is the gospel of peace. That gives you stability in this life. To know the devil tempts. Having been justified by faith, we already have peace with God. What are you talking about, devil? I'm already at peace with God. I know I'm a sinner, but I'm at peace with God. Paul says, stand and fight by taking up a shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts or the arrows of the evil one. Of course, the shield was the chief defensive weapon a uh, piece of armor of a Roman soldier. Uh, and here Paul says, faith is our shield, notice. It protects us from the devil's fiery arrows and darts. He's constantly shooting at us. He wants to wound our faith. He wants to wound our families. He wants to wound our marriages, our consciences, everything else about us. Take up the shield, notice, of faith. Faith in what? He's already been, he's told us a a hundred times already, it seems like, in this letter. In Christ. Right? In Him. All these things are in Him, in Christ. Faith in Christ. Again, 
you're beginning to see this. When the, when the devil makes accusations, when our conscience feels accused, the answer is always Jesus Christ. The shoes are the gospel of peace because what Christ has done. The breastplate is, a, is, is of righteousness because of what Christ has done. The helmet of salvation. The shield of faith. The belt of truth, because he's the truth. And so just like the devil tempted Jesus, and Jesus always pointed back to the scripture, in the same way he tempts us, and we do the same thing. We always point him, point him back to Christ. He's our advocate. He's the one who stands between us and the justice of God. And he stands between, between us and the devil's accusations. You got a problem, devil, with me? Go tell Jesus about it. He's already dealt with this. Why, why are you telling me, right? Go tell Jesus. Didn't he pay for my sins? Didn't he forgive me of all my sins? Hasn't he already given me his righteousness? Hasn't he already given me peace with God? Go tell him about it. See, the confidence is not in ourselves, it's in him. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Finally, he says, take up the, the stand and fight, take up the helmet of salvation. Obviously, a helmet protects what? Protects your head, right? Our helmet protects our minds, our consciences. We've got to be meditating upon our salvation constantly. On the sin that you've been redeemed from. On the love of God that moved him to save you in the first place. On God's providing Christ to save, on Christ being a full Savior. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. The helmet of salvation. Put that helmet on. Know what it means to be saved. Go back and read. If you don't know what it means to be saved, go back and begin reading in chapter 1 again and you'll see what it means. To be loved by God from all of eternity and chosen and predestined by Him to adoption as sons. To know the love of God in Jesus Christ who gave himself freely for us, who has redeemed us by his blood. And to have the Holy Spirit poured out into our hearts to seal us and to assure us and to guarantee to us that Christ has already purchased us and one day he's going to come back and take us to himself. The helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now notice all these pieces of armor. These are all, in a sense, defensive. There's, there's one piece of armor that's offensive. That's verse 17. Stand, therefore, again, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word, notice, is described as a sword here. The Word is described as a sword. Kids, I want you to ask your mom or dad next time uh, you guys are going to read the Bible at dinner table or whatever, and uh, I want you to say to them, go get the sword. <laughs> Mom, I need my sword. Dad, I need my sword. And they're going to be like, what are you talking about? Pastor Danny said, go get my sword. Right? The Bible. The Word. This is the, the most central piece of offensive armor that a Roman soldier had in fighting his battles. The sword. There were long swords... The Romans used long swords. They used uh, short swords called the gladius. It's a little two-edged sword. It's like a, like a long dagger. It was what they were known for because they, they, they would fight in close quarters with a huge shield and they would be able to fight and hack and do all kinds of uh, crazy things with those things. They had, there were straight swords. There were curved swords. All armies of the ancient world had swords. It was their most personal and most devastating piece of weaponry in that ancient world. But here Paul describes the word as a sword. First of all, like a sword, the word of God slays enemies, right? It kills. It kills. Are you using the sword that God has given to you to slay those enemies that you have? The world, the flesh, the devil. The world, the flesh, the devil. Use the sword. To fight against them. 
You know, oh, you know, pastor, there's too, many, there's too many pressures today in the world. It's too hard, you know, for our kids today. God gave you a weapon. God gave you a weapon. Use it, right? Read the word. Read the word. Use the sword. Fight. Now, don't forget the devil knows the word too. He knows it pretty well. He, you know this. He tempted the, the Lord Jesus Christ with the word. He likes to use the word, but he likes to modify the word, doesn't he? He likes to add to the word. He likes to take away from the word. He likes to take it out of context. Go read the quotes that the devil uses from the Old Testament in Matthew 4. Read them in the original context. He always twists and turns and takes from him just a little bit. It sounds plausible. It sounds right. The Lord, though, used those wor- his, the word of the Lord in response correctly. So like a sword, the word slays enemies. Like a sword, the word of God penetrates from the outward to the inward. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the word of God is like a sword and it penetrates joints and marrow, heart and soul and so forth. It penetrates. We have an enemy within us, our own flesh, our sinfulness, our proclivities to sin, our our desires to sin. Use the sword. Use the sword of the word against your flesh. But notice it's also called here, notice it's the the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit, notice. It's not just that that we have a sword, it's the word, but it's it's the sword of the Spirit. As Paul says elsewhere, All Scripture is inspired by God. It's breathed out by God. It literally is the word of the Holy Spirit. From the beginning, the Spirit of God has been the powerful agent of of God to create. In the beginning, in the creation, the Spirit of God hovers. Genesis 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God is that powerful, effective agent that causes the Son of God in human flesh to be conceived in the womb of his, of his mother, the Virgin Mary. The Word of God is uh, like, a, like described as a seed that comes into us and causes us to have new birth, new life. 1 Peter 1, for example. 1 Peter 2. If the Word of God is the Word of the Spirit, this means that for us to be more spiritual, we've got to be more and more saturated with the Word. Right? We read a few Sundays ago in Ephesians 5 where Paul says in verse 18, uh, instead of being drunk with wine, we are to be filled with the Spirit. Remember the, there are four things I mentioned that Paul, there's four verbs that Paul gives here. So, you know, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5. There's four things, he says, that we can do that are means by which we can be filled by the Holy Spirit. One of them is addressing, that's the first verb, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. So we can encourage each other with basically the word, right? Scriptural teaching in the form of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing, that's the second one, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart so we can encourage one another by addressing each other. We can also sing directly to God. Giving thanks. That's the third. Giving thanks. Always for everything. To God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks is a means that the Holy Spirit's filling us. And then finally, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, Paul says over in Colossians 3, verse 16, because this is a parallel uh, prison epistle I mentioned earlier this morning. In Colossians 3, verse 16, the apostle says this in a similar way. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. He's saying the same thing, but he's saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you. So to be spiritual is to have the word 
within us and in our hearts and our minds so that we can serve the Lord and that we can fight. So you're called to engage in spiritual war against a spiritual, unseen realm full of foes. Who's sufficient for this? Who of us is sufficient for this battle? That's why Paul says, put on God's armor. In ourselves, we're done for. There's no way we can stand toe-to-toe against the devil. No way. That's why Paul says, put on God's armor, the armor of God, and fight in his strength. With all this defense, but especially with this offense. And we'll come, Lord willing, next Sunday uh, to verse number 18. And uh, we'll see how Paul sums it all up, interestingly, uh, not with a piece of armor, defensive or offensive, but with prayer, but with prayer. This is the, the great way that we engage in spiritual war. But until then, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would uh, send us out uh, in the power of your Holy Spirit to serve you in this way by engaging in this spiritual battle, uh, not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ clothing ourselves in him every single day, reminding ourselves, uh, I am baptized. I've put on Jesus Christ. All this armor is mine already. Enable me, Lord, enable us to fight in this strength and to stand, to stand confident in the Lord. Uh, We ask now, now, Lord, that you would help us, that you would hear us, and that you would send us out uh, empowered again. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen.